just gives you an overview of the services and resources available through my office at the Capitol. Um, the public access room, I'll let you know, is the nation's only resource of its kind. We are, we'll be 24 years old in March, and we exist purely and exclusively to help people who are interested in being more actively involved in the world. And so, um, one of the things I'd like to make mention of, you know, we all know that there's a lot that's wrong in government. But what we sometimes forget is that there is a lot that's right there, too, like the creation of my office. And Hawaii really leads, leads the nation in many ways. Um, you may not know that we were the first state in the nation to have an ethics commission. And so there are all sorts of things like that. But, but you know, it's, uh, those are not the things people talk about. People talk about the things that need fixing. And I think that's <laughs> so, Next thing in your packet uh, is last, uh, last session's calendar. Why would I include something that ended in May last year? Um, and I will mention this. This is available on the Public Access Room's website, as all these handouts are, too. Um, the reason I have this in here is we have um, an official calendar, which is more boring than our office's one. And um, ours is color-coded. It will tell you what bill deadlines are, what resolution deadlines are, what budget deadlines are. But more importantly, you know, we talk in legislative speak. And so what is it these people are talking about? So on the back, we have defined these terms for you. So um, if you don't get this, if you don't get one of the packets, this is available on the Public Access Rooms website. For those that don't have cell phones, if you're still using just a, a little phone, um, <laughs> you know, it's like your introduction. Um, <laughs> thank you, yes. The cell phone is like a whole different thing. We're supposed to be grateful for the fact that you can't hear as well, and it breaks up now again. Anyway. So on the back, one of the free services that you pay dearly for through your state taxes is um, a toll-free set of numbers so that anybody anywhere in the state can contact their state government without having to pay long-distance charges. We got some more chairs over here. Got some more Okay, so uh, for the Big Island, uh, 974-4000, that will get you into the state switchboard. And uh, a little robot will come on the phone and will say to you to enter the five-digit extension of the party you wish to reach. little robot doesn't tell you how, what that five-digit extension is. It's the last five digits of any of our phone numbers. So were you to call our office, 974-4000, then extension 70478. If you use your cell phone, just find it 70478. Also on the back of this, there is a, uh, the email address to contact me, par at capital.hawaii.gov. That's the email address for my office. Below that is our web address, which is hawaii.gov slash lrb. We are part of the Nonpartisan Legislative Reference Bureau, uh, a service agency attached to the Capitol, uh, slash PAR. So hawaii.gov slash LRD slash PAR. And beneath that is the legislature's web address, uh, capital.hawaii.gov. Sometimes people will call up and say, oh, your website is down. Oh, I wish the website were down. I could get some work done, you know? But no, you're spelling capital with an A, aren't you? C-A-P-I-T-O-L. No money. So, yeah. Um, so, let's start. I call this presentation We the Powerful because it's really important to me that everybody understands that our uh, government is dependent on us. We are the center of our government, or why we have a government. And so we are the authorities in our lives. We know what works for us. We've got 76 legislators, around 3,000 pieces of legislation. It's not physically 
or mentally possible for them to be authoritative on all of the matters that they have to make important decisions about. But you and I know what works for us. And so it's that authority that the legislators need. And so it, think of this as a really symbiotic relationship. The legislators need your uh, authoritative input on the matters that concern you so that they can make good legislation that in turn will benefit your lives. So think of it as a circle that keeps going around. Um, yeah, for those who get the packet, this is a little eight-page color guided tour of the legislature's website. Uh, two years ago, this website was redesigned. They hired a guy that looks like he's not old enough to have a beer yet. Those are the ones that do these electronic things now. So he completely redid the website. And, and it was almost immediately declared the best legislative website in the nation. It's vast amount of material in this site, and it's fairly straightforward. And part of what we will do tonight is go through that. And just remember, you can always call my office and just ask questions where you go. Is that an extra copy there? I need one so I can make copies for the next but this person. is radiant. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, take, take his. That's right. Yeah. Um, this next handout is a kind of a flow chart on how a bill becomes a law. I find flow charts unutterably dull. And so we had a lady work for us last session that uh, we just couldn't keep her occupied. She worked too fast. And it's like, okay come up with an interesting design on how a bill becomes a law. And she did a pretty good job. More importantly, on the back, written testimony to bare basics. When you submit testimony on matters before the state legislature, there are no real rules about what your testimony is supposed to look like. But this is a good approach to use. If you're going to need date, time, and place of the hearing, rule number, that sort of thing. But then, um, just an overview of what might, might work on. The last thing that I have in these packets is, and this is, um, this is a work in progress. The state senate is making its first baby steps uh, toward video conferencing for neighbor islands. So this year there will be some... Um, I understand there's just two topics for this, education and arts. I, that's what I was getting ready to say what it was When are we going to be able to choose that we want to testify about a particular issue? That's what I was getting ready to tell you. Good. Okay. So there are going to be two committees, the Technology Committee and the Education Committee, and they will be having some of their hearings available for video conference. Uh, if you have questions and need to provide input, in the lower corner is uh, the information called the Senate Clerk's Office, which is 5866720. Um, the way it's going to be set up is still in the process. Um, and I understand that you want it to have happened already, but you start well, somewhere. about 10 years ago. Well, you start somewhere, right? And so they have started. So there's how that is. So let's go. We need the power. Um, uh, my office is on the fourth floor, room 401. Um, that's your office, so feel free to come in anytime during the interim in between legislative sessions. We are open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. During the session, we are open 8 to 7, Monday through Friday. And if we need to make special arrangements for other times, we can do that as well. Um, I won't go into much detail about this because it's in the little flyer that you have. Except I will mention that we are um, we do our very best in the office to make sure that um, people with a whole range of um, abilities um, are comfortable in the office. We are completely ADA compliant. We have uh, one. We have five public workstations uh, for computers. One of them is uh, in a, a workstation that is built to ADA specs for future. We have a TTY telephone for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, we have um, software that will read websites to blind people. Um, so, and we have two little tables where 
We're not a very large office at all, but since we're the only office of its kind in the nation, we are the largest. So that's how that one is. So I put this slide in here partly just a couple of reasons. One is if you ever people have been to the Capitol. Everybody, anybody been to the Capitol? Beautiful building. So, um, but if you're down there listening in to hearings and um, uh, just uh, the hearings process can get pretty intense, and so you can just come to our office and chill. Just come and sit, read the funny papers if you want. Just sit there, you know. Um, and it's a we can sometimes think of it as the Putin Honua of the Capitol. Uh, it is very, uh, very studiously nonpartisan. So. Uh, you know, we just recently had uh, the most amazing special session, which we call the also special session. Um, thousands, tens of thousands of people at the Capitol in late October and early November. And some of it was pretty lively, you know, <laughs> lively is such a kind word. Um, we had, you know, there were, at one point, there were people with flagpoles pounding on the glass windows to the House chamber, which is Wow. No, no. <laughs> the next day, they had put enough of a barrier that people could still look down into the chamber, but couldn't uh, try to be breaking the glass. Um, but in in our office, I, I just was so touched because we um, we are well known as a nonpartisan office, and every now and again, I'd have to go into anti mode and come out and say. Oh, it may not be applauding. We have televisions going. In. Uh, for the events that were going on. You may not applaud and you may not make disparaging remarks, and people were really respectful of that. And so 150 people or so a day coming through my office, all being just very gentle with uh, the things that matter to us, and that it's got to be a safe and comfortable zone for whomever and whatever your opinion is or whatever your issue is. So. And then also we do broadcast. Uh, non Leo takes all of our broadcasts. We send out about 350 hours a year of live hearings, briefings, and floor sessions. We can cover two events live at once. The constraint for the neighbor islands is that we only have the technical capability of sending one live at a time. So we will have to make a choice if we have two, which one is going live for the neighbor islands, and then we will um, uh, piggyback the other one. As soon as one is finished, we'll start the other. And then all of our broadcasts are archived on the legislature's website. So if you would like to watch all 56 hours of the uh, House hearing on same-sex marriage, you can watch all 56 hours as many times as you want. Wow. But you really need to get out more. <laughs> so. so it's only the full sessions and not the committee. No, we had, uh, we had, we covered the 56 hours of the House hearing. We uh, broadcast also the, the Senate was uh, much quicker. I think they had about a 12-hour hearing. I guess but I mean the regular session. We regular. cover um, uh, mostly committee meetings, uh, some floor sessions. Most floor sessions are, I don't know if it's going to be $8. Let me say. But it might be, uh, does anybody have any objections to any of the things on page four? No. Okay, how about page five? So that's a lot of what four sessions are like. But we always cover opening day, uh, both chambers. Uh, we always cover um, uh, the third reading, which is right before crossover when uh, all bills that are surviving in the House cross the Senate all surviving in the business and the House. And we cover some. If, if it's a matter of great import, we will cover a floor session. It's very expensive to do that, and these are your dollars, so we try to be really careful with that. And then we cover um, uh, the closing sessions as well. But most of the committees are for the work so. And you send it to Naleo here on this side? We, yes. We send out uh, everything we broadcast goes live throughout the state. Um, and everybody in the state except people on Kauai can watch them live, and people on Kauai cannot because Hawike, which is the equivalent to Naleo, they, their uh, management has decided years ago that people uh, of Kauai are not interested in what happens at the state capitol, and I keep asking them, how do you know if people can't see? 
Um, but they're persistent, you know, they don't. So any, and unless, you know, Hawaii is a separate thing. Uh, what's the terminology of crossover? Uh, when all surviving House bills cross to the Senate for additional consideration, and when all surviving Senate bills cross to the House. And we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. So, the two of us in the middle, Virginia Beck and I, are the year-round full-time people, and then we hired two additional people uh, that work from uh, early January until the middle of May. Um, and so when you call, you'll get somebody. We'll be happy to talk to you. We work on the legislative level and not the executive or the judicial. And we work at the state government level. Um, we you know we get questions all the time, and you know, you'll get people calling up who so don't, don't get the distinctions, and they'll go, "I can't believe what you were doing with the Akaka bill." And it's like that's the federal level. Let me give you a phone number, and then uh, you get the same thing on the county level too. We always we've all been run around, so we in our office are really committed to doing our best to be. If we are not the last call you have to make, we want to be the next to the last call. And that's what we try to do. We have uh, 25 senators and 51 members of the House, roughly two to one ratio. Each of us in our world has uh, both a representative and a senator who are um, there for the districts in which they live. What do they do? The legislators exist to serve us. And so they do that in a variety of ways. They, they serve. Uh, Regionally, as we just said, every, we all have a senator and a representative. Something's going on in your community you want the legislators to know about. Those would be the two people to call first. They also serve topically. They sit on various committees that cover various topics. Um, and I like to remind if you um, have something going on in your community, say, Say in the environmental realm. Find out if your legislators sit on the committee that is charged with that area of responsibility. So we've got two ways in on this one. Very helpful. Some certain leadership roles. These are the only four things that they really do. In, um, they, in the public hearings process, when they take in your testimony, they make decisions on on bills and resolutions and move them forward and so bills that survive that whole process are sent to the governor and that's how laws are formed. They pass resolutions which do not have the force and effect of law but can be very useful tools for moving matters forward. You might find resolutions, um, well, an example I often use is years and years ago I sat on uh, a natural area working group for this island. Um, there are 11 NARS, they're called, on this island, and there were a lot of conflicting usages. Um, uh, native practitioners, uh, scientists, hunters, gatherers, uh, recreational users, all kinds of people, and those, those uh, conflicts amongst those users uh, was, a, was a, a distressing thing. So this is when Dwight Papamina was in the house. He uh, introduced a resolution that passed the legislature and uh, created the natural area working groups. And so we met monthly for a year. The scientists, recreational users, native practitioners, all of us sat down in, in a, a group and just worked out the differences. And, and we, you know, this, this NARS is pretty much trash. There's not a lot of native vegetation, not a lot of things like that in it. So, Let's make that recreational. These are very pristine, and let's preserve that pristine nature of the plants and animals that live there. And so that's a good example of something that a resolution can do. It can uh, call for studies, that sort of thing, but it doesn't uh, take the expense or have the permanence of law. Uh, I know another thing resolutions will often do is get people comfortable with an idea. Um, I often use the idea of um, medical marijuana. When that first came up, it's just some legislators and some members of the public was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, they should have tried it. 
<laughs> but um, it took several years. Resolutions were passed, and and that not just educated the public, but educated some of the legislators too. And after some amount of time, the bill was introduced, and then we became one of the states that does have a medical marijuana law, which was recently amended. Um, and legislators propose amendments to the Constitution. There's always a big bunch of, of uh, bills introduced to amend the Constitution, but even the people who are introducing legislation to change the Constitution know that they have very low chance of passing because you don't want to be tinkering with the foundation of your house very much. House won't fall down the book. You don't want to tinker with your Constitution very much either. And so there were 47, 47 bills introduced last session to amend the Constitution, only two passed. And you will see them on the next ballot. We would never entrust changing this foundation document to mere legislators. That has to come to you and me. We are the ones that make that decision in the ballot box. And so on the next uh, ballot that you uh, pick up and start voting with, uh, you will see one about early childhood education and another uh, that passed last year also about the mandatory retirement age for judges. So, so just bear that in mind. And uh, if you want to read all of them, I can show you where they are. This is the opening page of the legislature's website. If, I know this is not going to apply to this community clearly, but if you or somebody you know doesn't know who their legislators are, Upper right corner, find your legislator. Just put a street name in. You don't put an, an address, just the name of the street. And so the example I worked up to come over here, I used Ainaola, which is a street down in, in Hilo. I thought that would be a good one to use. And so you will see here, if you can see that, uh, Cliff Suji is the representative, and uh, Gil Pahele is the senator for that area. Every name that you will find in this website, things like this, will be hyperlinked to those individuals' pages. So if you need to contact them, you just click on that. And you would get this, for instance, Cliff Suji's page. The legislator will be pictured, and then the contact information, uh, the district number that they serve, uh, email address. Below that, you will find the names of the committees that that individual sits on. Every one of these is hyperlinked as well. And then basically, the rest of the legislator's page is uh, devoted to what that person decides to put on the page. And you will see here uh, his office. They, his office is literally next door to mine. And so they put um, our workshop schedule on there, which is very sweet. Um, so if you're going to go meet with the legislator, go look at their page. Because you actually <clears throat> going to be more effective if you don't just come in and go, you need to do this and this and this and this. You want to have a conversation. These are your neighbors, too, you know, and find out what's on their page. And, and you have some basis for a conversation with them. And uh, every now and again, somebody will go meet with the legislator and say, is there some way I can help you? And then when the legislator gets picked up off the floor, that somebody actually offered to do that for them. It's really great. Um, likewise, Senator Cahele, um, this is what his page looks like, and he puts a lot of photos from PhotoStream on his side, so it, it, it helps to get to know them. Want to find out who all of the legislators are? <coughs> we have six magic buttons in the middle of the opening page of the legislature's website. Lower mm -hmm. left is uh, going to give you a listing of all of the legislators. It starts out looking like this. Uh, you can sort by Senate only or House only. Every name is hyperlinked. And then over here, a uh, little bit of a description of the districts that they serve. Committees. Again, hyperlinked. And the example we chose was the Senate mm -hmm. Energy Environment Committee. Where you would click on that, you would go to this page where you would see your own uh, Senator Ruderman as the vice chair of this committee. Um, so the chair and the vice chair will always be pictured on the committee page. 
Uh, again, contact information. And below that, you will find hyperlinked names of the additional people who sit on whatever that committee is. If you're going to go poking through the legislature's website, you will find Sam Sloan's name on every Senate committee. Why? Only Republican. Only Republican. He is the only Republican we have in the Senate. Um, and so he gets to sit on all Senate committees. I think the thing that saves uh, Sam Sloan is that he has an absolutely outrageous sense of humor. And I ran into him the other day briefly and I said, I just want to let you know, I make jokes about you all the time, and he went, what? <laughs> um, but I say, you know, I tell people in our workshops that since you sit on all committees, you run into yourself all day long. It's like, <laughs> and going. It's like you're in this committee and that committee. You run into yourself in the hallway and go, hey, Sam, how's it going? Fine, Sam, how's it going? You know, and all the fun he goes. And so um, he's a busy man. So, um, and, and you know, if you're watching the hearing, and you might you might kind of get like this, that all of the members of that committee might not be in the room listening to your, your very important things you have to say. But this may be part of that, because the, 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 uh, the workload is absolutely astounding. Over here, this page was captured in late January, last, um, if that almost a year ago now, and so what you will find again on the committee's page, anything that is currently scheduled for a hearing will be in this area, and then the entirety of things that have been referred to that committee will be listed down below. If you ever want to look at a hearing notice, anytime you see, see it, that is how you're going to get to that hearing notice. We know the answer to this. The most important people in our whole system of government that's me. So, last, um, back when we had the special session, you know, like I said, there were tens of thousands of people that came in the course of two weeks' time um, to, to that event, you know, the ongoing series of events. And so, I like to have photos of lots of people at the Capitol. It's very stirring to me. Do we cease to participate? In our democracy, it will cease to be a democracy. And so the whole system hinges on our active involvement in it. But make sure you're getting together with a lot of other people that um, have, have similar concerns because there's great power in numbers. Absolutely great power in numbers. So you're more effective, you don't burn out as much, that sort of thing. But I just love this photo right here. You know, because sometimes you might be, you know, maybe not everybody in the world is fascinated by whatever this issue is like I am. So I tell people, you know, if you are all by yourself or you feel like you are on some issue, find a way to stand out. If you want to come to a hearing, dress like that, you'll stand out. They might call security on you, but they would remember you. So just, just uh, you don't... You don't have to wear a fan tan dress in there, but um, just, um, you know, you have the right, and it's your government, and make sure you make the best use of this wonderful creature that we have. These are our jobs as citizens. We elect our legislators, vote on this constitutional amendment. The very brave among us run for office, and then we focus in these presentations on these things at the bottom. How do you be an effective communicator with the legislators in order to get what you need from the system? When does it all happen? Um, we like the interim the best because they're not in session. But it's also, besides the fact that we can only, maybe sometimes we only work 11 hour days instead of 15 hour days. And so we, we like it for that reason too. But this is really an important time. This is when your legislators might have time to spend um, um, quality time with you, getting to know, come, come to a site visit. Let us show you the, what you would call it, that is really important. Um, come and meet with, you know, let's have a coffee hour so that you can get to know us better and, and we can get to know you better. And so make good use of that. Also, if, if, you know, we have the right to ask our legislators to introduce legislation on our behalf. They're not, I mean, they're not committed to doing that, they don't have to, but if you want a bill introduced, 
that what might make it into law. If you wait till the session begins up here, we would have a snowball chance of all that happening because they work incredibly long and hard hours and they just can't do it. So this is when that happens. The last session ended on May the 2nd. And by May the 3rd, legislators were sending bills to our bill drafting entities. So, uh, and, and let me just mention this. Um, a legislator could be the best person in the world at writing legislation. Won't matter. It still has to go to one of five resources at the state capitol for bill review and bill check. And we have uh, both the House and the Senate have majority staff offices and minority staff offices. That's the four. Um, and then the, the, the bureau that I work for, Legislative Reference Bureau, has um, a research division. And that's where a lot of bills are drafted. Uh, we write for Republicans, Democrats, House, and Senate. So um, everything has to go through one of those. And so make sure if you do want to get some legislation introduced on your behalf, uh, you give it to them. Right, right now, our, our researchers are, are right now just working very well on that already. So are you saying we can present it to your committee rather than to our legislature? You can present it to a legislature to see if you can sweet talk them into introducing it as a bill. And the example I would use is one year I did this. Um, you know, I, was, uh, I moved from, I come from coal mining people in Virginia, in the mountains of Virginia, very poor people. Are, uh, and then I was living on North Shore of Kauai for 10 years until Hurricane Aniki decided that it was time for me to move. And um, so I went to Oahu, and now I'm a sophisticated city girl. And so one of the things, when I, when I go over to Kailua Kona, I just go nuts because you're approaching the traffic tunnel on Pali Highway, and cars are doing this zip, 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 zip thing, and it's just like, this is so unsafe. And so I wrote my legislator one year, and I said, please introduce a bill on my behalf that would make it illegal for cars to switch lanes as they're approaching a tunnel or when they're in a traffic tunnel. So you have those kinds of rights, too. It's not just sending emails. Um, um, it's not just uh, providing testimony. You have other ways that you can communicate effectively with them, too. So bear that in mind. So in here, every little pie slice in here represents major deadlines. And so uh, we, we live and die by the calendar. So those of you who got the calendar, let me just stop here for a little minute. Last year, the session began on January the 16th. The Constitution says that we will begin at 10 a.m. on the third Wednesday in January every year. So if that's what the Constitution says, that's what we do. One week later, last year it was actually the following Thursday rather than the following Wednesday because we had a state holiday in there, Dr. King's birthday. Um, but usually one week for bill introduction. The entirety of the rest of the legislative calendars devoted to killing those bills off. <laughs> And what's left in some form or another is what goes to Uncle Neil for him to have his chance at these things. So, um, in that one week's time period last year, we had a very low number of bills introduced because they've really been trying to cut back. So there were 2,872 pieces of legislation <laughs> introduced. It's been, uh, tip, it has gone over 4,000 in, in previous years, usually around 30, uh, 3,500. That's a lot of pieces of legislation. But let's talk about attrition here. March the 7th last year was first crossover that you were asking about. That first crossover, um, House bills have been going through House committees, Senate bills through Senate committees, and then they have to switch and go to the other, the other chamber uh, for the whole same thing to start all over. At that point, at crossover deadline, we were down to 757. 80% of the bills were done, over with, gone. So very high attrition rate. 
At the end of the calendar, we had 291 of them left, and 288 of those became law. So we had a really high rate of bill passage last year, 10%. That's high. So um, it's it's quite a ride. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So what is going on here? Who's making the best laws for the state of Hawaii? And I will emphasize time and time again that that is very dependent on you expressing the authority that you have over the things that matter to you. I'm hillbilly, so I like this slide. Um, we had the farm in the summer. We wanted to eat in the winter when I was a child. Um, but that's not really why I have this in here. The Three Sisters um, is, is known far and wide as the way to grow these three crops. Because if you grow these crops separately, you will have less yield than if you grow them together. Um, you will increase the yield on all three crops by planting them as companions to one another. Why would that be? Well, the corn stalk acts as the bean pole, so you don't have to go and stake your beans. And the beans stabilize the corn in the wind. And the squash has thorns, protects it, the leaves mulch the soil. So, this is in here as a reminder not just to work with the people that you are in complete alignment with. Because, you you know, all corn is just all corn. But work with people that you're not in complete alignment with. Strange bedfellows. When they talk about politics and strange bedfellows, they really mean it. Um, so, so make sure to draw on the strengths of people with whom you're not in complete alignment. Find the thing that you have in common. There will be something that you have in common, I promise you. And when you can find that thing, you plant that seed in that common soil, you have the beginnings of an understanding that will grow to the benefit of both. I often ask people to think about this. When you are, uh, you know, you're going to have opponents. They're not your enemies, they're your opponents. But you and your opponents, do you really want a solution that works just for you? Or would you like to have a solution that also works for your opponent in some way? So be mindful of that as you are seeking solutions, that you will want something in the perfect world that will that will further both your lives. So this is kind of like trying to get from here out out to here, this act, I mean, I just love it. This is actually, uh, we hope not. No, I know. Yes, really. I do well, you know, but this is what I do with it. That's why I think about that. So, right, widening the road is the uh, it's not always the only solution. So, because we're a nonpartisan office, we're also a non-issue oriented office, all process, no policy, all that. So, if I were to take, um, a, a real true piece of legislation and use that to to track through the legislative process that could be perceived whether it is or not it could be perceived as me being partisan so so we decided to create a completely ridiculous piece of legislation to show you how things change as they move through the system so so maybe you wanted to write your legislator or pick up the phone and call and say Let's make a bill, let's, let's have a law that requires everybody in the state to use a bicycle rather than a car, certainly cut down on pollution, um, and so all our traffic woes would be solved. So uh, this is, uh, I don't suggest you ask for this specific thing, but these are the kinds of things that you can do. You have that right to go to your legislators and say, please, please do this. So who would you contact? Your own representative or senator, it's a nice protocol to start there. You don't have to. Maybe you're not aligned with those people. But, you know, it's something to think about. They, they do represent you in your district. Um, look to the committees that would deal with specific areas and see, one, if your legislator is on that committee or uh, who else is on that committee. Uh, you know, Hawaii's a small and personal place. Uh, maybe your auntie's third cousin's uncle is next door neighbors to one of the legislators, and so you go that route. 
It's not always direct. There's a lot of lateral influence that goes on here, too. So check with those people. And then uh, we do a little bit of research, and we can help you with that, find out what legislators have been involved in, whatever this issue is in the past. I've already talked about this, that January 14 deadline, or when the legislature begins, when we're um, in this coming session, we will actually have fewer bills introduced. Why would that be? Is that a. Well, I you couldn't tell if you had your hand up or you're waving your pen around. I did. You said we could research what bills they've been involved with. It, how much do you keep of past year voting records so we could see how they were? You could. We had, the legislature has been online since 1999. And so and you have all of that in the past? Uh, we, well, at the further back you go in the count in the um, in, in history, the more primitive it looks, you know, and so there's less information further back. But but the bureau that I work for also have, we have the Legislative Records Bureau Library. And it's a wonderful resource and they have uh, information that goes back to the days of the kingdom, some of it. So there are ways to find out who has been involved. So just give us a call if you need to. Yeah. So, and we actually don't know what the calendar is going to look like yet. We know it's going to start on January 15, but the Senate President and the Speaker of the House are the ones that determine how the calendar is going to unfold, and we are waiting for that. Um, they um, hopefully will have it out pretty soon since we don't have much time before the session starts. But that's um, we are anticipating maybe in the next week or so. But we don't we don't know yet. But the calendar <coughs> itself is going to be. There's no magic to bill number. If it's a House bill, it starts with HB. If it's a Senate bill, it starts with SB. In this case, this was in 2009. <laughs> This bill was the 1,243rd bill to hit the clerk's desk. So, oh, and I, I, uh, as an aside, we will have fewer bills introduced in the coming session because we have a biennial system. We, uh, the legislative session that begins after an election is an odd-numbered year. So in 2013, that was the first year of the biennial. Any bills that did not pass into law or get vetoed is still technically alive. I think of them as Lazarus bills. And they don't look that good sometimes, but, but all of those can come back to life in the coming session. So, so there are several thousands of bills sitting in the hopper right now. And so in the second year of the biennium, there will always be fewer bills introduced because there are perfectly good bills sitting there. And so a bill that uh, moves into the second year of the biennium does not have to start over. If you had a bill, uh, say a Senate bill, was referred to two committees, passed those, crossed to the House, died in the first House committee, that's where it could come back to life. So every point along the way, that's true. At the end of the second year of the biennium, bills that do not make it really do die. But bills die all the time, ideas never do. So you just keep at it. Sometimes, you know, it's, and sometimes it's frustrating if your bill doesn't make it through quickly, but um, a lot of really horrible legislation is prevented from coming into law as well because of that slowness. So what you have to do is you just have to keep at it until you wear them down. That'll work. Here's what's going to happen to this beautiful bill that we're going to talk about. It's going to be given committee assignments. The example we're going to use is a House bill. It could just as easily be a Senate bill. It will be assigned to various committees which have specific kulianas. There, there's a you know, there's human services, there's health, there's agriculture, all of these various things. When you are writing your testimony, be very mindful of the kuleana of the committee that you are sending your testimony to. You want to focus your attention on that committee's responsibility <coughs> and craft your testimony accordingly. In between committee meetings, 
bills have to go down to the floor to the House or the Senate so that the committee of the whole, all of the members of the House, all of the members of the Senate, can check in to see if they're satisfied with the way things are going in the committees. And they're called readings, and it's not like our legislators sit there in these stacks of documents and read through them on the floor. It's that they're taking a reading of what's going on in the committees. Um, and people have a hard time kind of getting the concept of reading, so I have a slide in a moment that might help a little bit. Because I have a hard time explaining it. One version only of a bill would go to the governor if it passes that far. Um, one of the reasons we have a lot of bills introduced and this is perfectly legitimate thing to do. Um, your bicycle bill, maybe you want to um, have your representative introduce it. You can have your senator introduce an identical piece of legislation. They're called companion bills. I personally don't really care for that term because the minute one or the other of them changes, you're not really companions any longer, they're no longer identical. Um, and so often people will have bills introduced in both chambers to increase the opportunities, the chances that a bill might, might make it through. One, uh, once the bill gets to the governor's desk, he has three options available to him. He can sign it into law, he can veto it, he can allow it to become law without his signature. And that does not affect the outcome of the uh, the, the legislation, if he does that, it just says, oh, I'm the governor, I don't like this bill that much, but if, uh, but I don't necessarily want to risk uh, having it vetoed. And so I might just let it, let it pass into law. Here's my reading slide. The con wait, 60 legislative days in the calendar. And so mid-January, late April, early May, because there are other days in the calendar too, there's Saturdays, Sundays, there are recess days when they don't meet in chambers. But they check in with to see what the committees are doing. <coughs> if they support the work, they move it forward. Uh, during same-sex marriage legislation, uh, uh, well, four amendments can be offered. It's very rare for a four amendment to make it. Uh, but so, so bills aren't necessarily only amended in committee. They can be amended in that committee of the whole meeting. During same-sex marriage legislation, there were 29 more amendments to that piece of legislation. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Do you mean that in a meeting of the whole uh, let's say everybody's still working in all their committees and everything, that they would take each committee and then they would go bill by bill by bill by bill by bill, or they just do it as a whole, the committee's work as a whole, and say, okay, you're doing Individual a bills. And that one is through. Yeah, and so, um, so you might have had, oh, 50, you know, uh, X many bills come out of this committee and X many out of that <coughs> one, and so they are kind of um, put on a, an agenda a hearing notice for the committee of the whole. Now, does and the committee have to vote on them to get them to that point? Absolutely. To the first reading, to the second yes. reading, to the third reading? Actually, not to the first reading, because uh, all bills pass first reading, so it makes you wonder why they do it. But, uh, all right, so the first one is just... Yeah, it's on the, the, the bingo one. card. Okay, now, mm -hmm. so the second one, in order to get to the second reading, the committee has to pass it to get to that point. Yes, excellent. Which takes excellent. a majority. Of the committee. It takes the majority of the committee. Okay. Great. Yes. There's another question on that. I know. It, it, it's, it's true, though, the committees can, even the committee chairman can, choose not to hear a bill. Absolutely, and I will cover that in just a moment, too, because but I'll, I'll do it now since you brought it up. Chairs are very powerful people. Very powerful people. And uh, think, think of this. Maybe there were. Maybe there's going to be 350 education bills introduced. I don't know. I don't know what the number would be, but let's say that. So, so you're the chair of the uh, House Education Committee, and you're looking here, and you've got this tiny little calendar, and you've got all of these measures. Most of them are never going to get heard. Most of them are just going to sit there and look noble until they die. Um, there are X many meetings that that committee is going to have 
before deadlines start kicking in. And so the chairs have to make the decision which ones they're going to hear and which ones they're going to not hear. And so that's... So a point of input is, first of all, to the committee chair that you know your bill has been assigned to or bill you're interested in. And then at the first, uh, when the, that committee is actually going to uh, vote the first time to send it to be the hearing of the committee of the whole, you because you would want them to pass it, right? Yeah, you do. Well, or uh, likewise, you can say, you can call up the chair of the committee and go, you do it more politely than this, but you know, this bill really sucks. Why would you spend your time on this when you have all these important things uh, that, that uh, really need to be heard? So you can use your influence that way. Please make sure this gets on an agenda. Okay. Please get make sure this gets put on a hearing notice. It's important whether it lives or dies. It's important for the people to have a chance to do this. And you find out what which ones are making it on by going to the website for that particular committee. I can show you how that's going to work. Yes. So in other words, if let's say the people in this room all want the bill to be heard and the chair of the committee is not going to hear it, and if we all call and put pressure on this person... Well, I like to think of it as being persuasive. First of all, <laughs> we, we try and persuade this person to at least hear this bill. Yes. Is there some kind of record that goes out that they have 150 people call them? Probably, but yeah, every office, you know, 76 different offices and 76 different ways of doing kind of the same thing. I've worked in a lot of offices at the Capitol, and um, I'm almost certain to be able to guarantee you that any time you call about a bill that uh, or about a topic, um, GMOs, pesticides, same-sex marriage, whatever it is, you call your legislator and you go, I think blah, 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 blah. You're, gonna, you're not going to talk to the legislator, most likely, which is good. You, you want to know staff better than you know legislators, because they know where the files are for one thing. But um, you, that person's going to say, thank you very much, hang up, and then somewhere there's a tally sheet in that office. And it's like, uh, this gentleman came in with uh, um, a no vote on um, space exploration bill, blah, blah, blah. So, so they, they're keeping informal tabs because people want to know what their constituents think. What if you're not a constituent? You call it anyway, but you're going to have more influence with your own legislators because they're yours, but um, you have the same power of persuasion for uh, committee members that are dealing with topics. I saw some other hands. Yes. Uh, so uh, the first time, the first reading, you said that passes, that moves on. Um, are there changes made at that time? It, hang with me and I will show you. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Is there any other ways to bypass the chair's denial of the bill? Um, you could go to, if it's, a, if it's before the House, you could try going to the Speaker. Speaker's office, you can try, if it's in uh, the Senate's Kuliana, you can try going to the Senate President. They do give, uh, the, the leadership gives um, a lot of credence to what the Chair's wishes are, but things do happen that way, you know. Oh, use, use whatever nonviolent legal <laughs> approach works for you. Hang on a second. Yeah. How is money getting money from state to county? Uh, was paying more money to Matt Bassett, uh, whatever. How would you do that? Well, uh, right now, starting next week, um, a thing that we broadcast every year is all of the executive departments come to the Capitol and make their case for funding for that. And that's how that's going to happen. And the counties uh, always come and they um, there's, there will be a specific time for the counties to make their presentations to the Ways and Means and the Finance Committee saying, we need a bigger share of the TAP. And so it's a perpetual thing because everybody, you know, there's this much money and this much need. And that's, you know, how, how persuasive are you? Yeah. So if the Senate chair will not hear a bill, you could 
go to the head of the Senate. Do you ask him to bring the bill out to the full Senate, or what is it you ask? Uh, you would ask her, the Senate President right now, Sonny Kim, and you would um, say that you're um, hopeful that uh, the chair of that committee could be persuaded to have this matter put on an agenda. But I made mention earlier of lateral influence, too. Um, so, Senator, I don't know, pick what, Senator Kahele has a hearing, uh, if he's chair of the committee, and he's not getting your bill on the agenda, and you're afraid that a deadline is going to come and your matter is going to go on, okay? And so maybe you want to call Senator Ruderman and say, you know, call, call your friend, see if you can get him to be persuaded. Sometimes bills, it's, it's not just, um, I'm being a meanie and I don't want to put this on an agenda, it's that there is just so little time. You know, and people are always saying, well, why don't you have a longer session? It's like, you want to pay for a longer session? You'd have to talk to people into that. But if the chair does not want to hear it, what is there a persuasion that's helpful from the head of the Senate? Or, or I, would, I would be cautious in doing that, but it is technically something that you could do. Yeah. yeah so. Yes? In the last note, down there, you said um, in order for bills or resolutions to pass, they must be read three times to each chamber. What chambers are you referring to? The House and the Senate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's um, it. Yeah. It, it will depend on where it is. If it's in the House, it would have to be read three times. There's one more question. Yes. Well, um, is there some way under the current system of, of tracking concurrency if there's been a bills introduced in both the House and the Senate on the same subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can show you that in a few minutes. Yes, it'll, it'll be covered here. Okay, last question. Um, in, the, in the referrals to committees, do the bills have to pass out of all committees to make it to the floor for a vote? Um, it has to be, have, if the bill is referred to three committees, it would have to pass all three. All three, okay, yes. thank you. Yep. So, here we go, deadlines. Pass all three and read all three so times yeah. three. Well, if it's on, if a bill, let's say a bill you're interested, the bicycle bill you're interested in, has got three committees, do you really want it to go? So it has to, it goes three times in the Committee of the Whole because on the first reading it's under the agenda for each of the three committees, right? And then it goes back to each of the committees and let's say they all pass them. So there's three more then are then going to go to the Committee of the Whole. Right? I lost you. Tell you what, hold that for a minute and let's try to move forward so that maybe right. the example will help. Great. Okay. Good idea. All right. So. Uh, this is going to be a house bill because we decided it's going to be a house bill. So it's going to be called Relating to Transportation, the Bicycle Bill. The title will not change. The title cannot change on a bill. That's not the case for resolution, but for bills it is. So it will always be called Relating to Transportation, and its content always has to be about transportation. So that you cannot put a bill that's about uh, the, the biology of centipedes into a bill that's about transportation. So you're saying you, you cannot, but they tried that last year quite a few times. Okay. Now it's done. Hmm. Bills, bills that had nothing to do. A line was injected in one of our issues. I forget what bill it was, but a line was put in all of a sudden by. Senator Solomon, I think it was, it had nothing to do with the bill. And she tried to sleaze that, I mean, she tried to get that bill. She tried to get that bill. She persuaded that to get that bill. So, sorry. sorry so. All right, so shall we move on? Okay. Our bill's basic bill number is going to be House Bill 123 because it will have been the 123rd bill introduced uh, to the House that session. So. And it's uh, basically going to say bicycles are mandatory for all citizens. Passes first reading. That's the X on the bingo card. Uh, the, the, the House decides that this is worthy of being heard, and so they do this. Um, and it, uh, that is its first reading on the floor. 
After that, it goes to, the, because this is a house bill, in the speaker's office, the head of the house, uh, some poor beleaguered staff person, people, they're going to have a stack of all of these house bills, and they're going to be reading through them and, and deciding the committee assignments for it. This is clearly a transportation matter. So it's going to have transportation as its subject committee. Presumably, if it passes uh, that committee, it would need to go to public safety because there are clear safety implications to all of us getting on bicycles and, and heading down the highway. And how are you going to fund it? There is going to be funding considerations. Anytime there is monetary consideration for a measure, its last committee in the Senate has to be Ways and Means, Senate Money Committee. Its last House committee has to be Finance. So when you are crafting your testimony, you might have, say you might wind up testifying at this bill, on this bill every point along the way. So you might have, uh, you, it's a lot of work, and so maybe you have like a little standard paragraph that you include about why this is such an important thing. But be mindful of the, uh, the area of responsibility for that committee and craft your testimony accordingly. In the finance committee, you're not going to be spending the time talking about we have terrible traffic flows. You're going to be talking about how are we going to fund this, or, or perhaps uh, wouldn't it be nice? Uh, uh, how will this be uh, an income generator for the state? Those kinds of things. So bear that in mind. So does it get a reading after it goes through? Hang with me, and I'll show you. Yes, it's coming. I just have a quick question. When you say the bill is initially read by the House representative, does that mean the, um, the leader is up there at a podium reading the bill? No, out it's like I said, they're not reading. They're taking a reading of what goes on in the committees. But first reading, all bills pass first reading. If it's, they're not reading, then how is the bill getting transmitted to the people of the representatives? Well, it's filed online. You'll be able to see it on the legislature's website. They're all there. Yeah. So. So everybody, the transportation chair decides that this is a, a bill that needs to go on an agenda, and so uh, he or she puts it on a uh, hearing notice, and uh, everybody sends in their testimony, and they decide it's a really good piece of legislation, and so they pass it unamended, which uh, can be done. Um, <laughs> it's not that uncommon. <laughs> I don't keep track of such things. If, if you want to go and figure that out, feel free. Yeah. So, um, it goes on to the Public Safety Committee, but um, Mom and Dad have a little bit of issue with, uh, you know, the four-year-old getting out on the highway on a bicycle and uh, getting his little head cracked open, and so they say, you know, good idea, but let's... It could be a better idea if you change this bill, and so please amend this bill uh, to take uh, safety considerations in. And so they do. Um, they listen to public testimony, and then they amend the bill and say, uh, the new version of the bill, House Bill 123, House Draft 1, is created, and that says you've got to ride a bicycle, got to wear a helmet. The original version of the bill goes by the wayside. It's no longer under consideration. So, uh, subsequent to this, you're not going to be testifying on the content of the original bill. You're going to be testifying on the version that is before the next committee. So, it goes down to the floor, the House Draft 1. It passes second reading along with dozens and dozens of other bills. And it goes to the Finance Committee. Finance Committee says, uh, okay, we've got to fund this somehow, so we're going to create a new version of the bill, House Bill 123 House, draft to ride a bicycle, wear a helmet, pay a dollar a year into the highway fund. That's the version that goes down to the floor. Third reading is uh, that major deadline that is right before crossover. So we broadcast third reading so that you can see the big floor debates. Every now and again, bills will get down to the floor for third reading beforehand, but the bulk of them are going to uh, be heard uh, a couple of days before that crossover deadline. And so those are very long floor sessions. We usually broadcast for 12 hours or so, and, um, and you get to watch all of that if you wish. Mm -hmm. Passes third reading and goes to the Senate for consideration. 
And so now our, our screens are not going to be, this color is going to be blue so that you can see that we've switched to a different chamber. So the Senate takes the bill, and somebody in the Senate President's office gives this bill its committee assignments, um, say public safety and health committees meeting jointly. If it passes there, we go to the Senate Transportation Committee. If it passes there, we go to Ways and Means. I partly put this in here just as a reminder. If you're looking at a hearing notice, you might, you know, the nomenclature can be confusing. If you were to see, for instance, PBS slash HLT slash indicates committees meeting jointly. Civic colons indicate committees meeting in sequence. Um, and part of the reason that you will see this happen is that tight calendar. Maybe a matter really needs to be heard by four communities, but there's just not enough time, and so they, they will clump them up. So if this were the case, let's go on to the public. Public, this is not pretty, okay? This is called gut and replace. So public safety and health committees, they decide that, yeah, no, we don't like this. But we're not going to kill it. We're going to pull the content out. We're going to amend the bill. This is still going to be about transportation, so it follows the rules. Take out all of this content. We're going to stick content in. Instead, it says bicycles are forbidden in the state of Hawaii. Part of the reason I have this in here is we get a lot of college students in our classes. You know, this is like uh, the school social worker, whomever. But I know you'd rather be out drinking beer them following this piece of legislation, I would too. But make sure that you do keep an eye on your bill because just because it's alive doesn't mean it's doing what you want it to be doing. So, so bear that in mind. Um, so people get um, Sherry Bracken as your reporter over here. So she writes something up in the local paper and people just get all wrong about this. And so they, they go to the Transportation Committee and say, this is absurd, what have you all done? And so the Transportation Committee, in this case, does a debt and replace as well. And so they go back to the earlier concept. So bear that in mind. But of course, they have their own little spin on it. Um, bicycles, if you're 18, ride in the same direction of traffic. So, Stop for a moment and think. You started out with this bill that says, we want, we want traffic not to be a problem anymore. So it's a good idea, but it wasn't necessarily a good piece of legislation. This is where your authority comes in. Your input, your testimony. They cannot be authorities on all of these subjects, but you know what, well, you don't actually want your four-year-old day craft open, so mm -hmm. let them know that. So, this is where that symbiotic relationship comes in. It's up to you. So, Senate Draft 2, version of the bill, goes down to the floor and passes um, second reading down there. And let me just mention, you know, we've saved three readings. Even, and this is unusual, that a bill would only be referred to one committee, but it, it happens occasionally. Usually it's not really compelling stuff, but it does happen. Even if you had a bill that was only given one committee referral, it would still have to pass three readings. And so the committee of the whole would have to have three opportunities to examine that matter. So, and it doesn't have to have three committee referrals, but it does have to have three readings. Who's on the committee of the whole? All of the members of the House in the House and all of the members of the Senate in the Senate. It's the legislature, yeah, yeah. This throws people a little bit too. Ways and Means does not hold public hearing. They hold a decision-making meeting instead and then they modify the bill anyway. Why would that be the case? Think about the calendar. You have 2,800, 2,900 pieces of legislation, four months to cover all of this stuff. Ways and Means, for instance, would have to be the last Senate committee if there are any monetary implications. And so, House and Senate rules differ in numbers of ways, and uh, they're available online. I can show you who those are. But uh, in the Senate, one of the things the rule says is that a public hearing has to be held. And so, had this matter only gone to one committee, say Ways and Means, 
then Ways and Means would have to have held that public hearing where they say, we're sitting in the room, the audience is there, and would anybody like to come up and testify uh, verbally about this matter? Now, just because they only, in this case, were holding a decision-making meeting does not mean that you should not send in testimony. You should send in your written testimony however you choose, and that's an important thing. But they probably, or Ways and Means is the one that does this most often, they probably are not going to say, would you like to come up and testify or so. But it's still a very important thing. The decision-making hearing is, is quite important. So we now have the Senate Draft 3 version. Uh, bicycle, 18, same direction of traffic, $50 a year. The prodigal bill must go home. If this bill started in the House, got amended, whatever happened to it, it crossed to the Senate, whatever happened to it there, in the House, because this is a House bill, they need to know what happened to their beautiful bill when it went over to the other chamber. If they like it, if they think the Senate Draft 3 version is perfectly fine, and this would be decided on the floor, in one of the floor sessions, um, um, and maybe they do like it, and so then it would go directly to the governor for his, uh, his consideration. Most likely, I do love this photo. Uh, the one that works for me took this photo. We see things very differently because we're looking in opposite directions. If they decide um, that they're going to disagree, there's an opportunity for a conference committee where members of the House, certain members of the House, certain members of the Senate, get together to try to work out a compromised version of this measure. So, um, who's going to sit on a conference committee? Members of the, of the uh, subject committees will be there, somebody. Um, various other people. There will be some Republicans, some Democrats, so you know what Sam Sloan is doing during conference time. He's everywhere. Um, who's not ever going to sit on a conference committee is anyone who ever voted no anywhere along the way. Because you already said you don't like the bill. Why would we put you on a conference for its uh, successful passage? So you don't see a lot of no votes at the Capitol. You see I with reservations. That's, that's government speak for no. But that might get you onto a conference committee. Now at conference, you don't testify. It is a public meeting, absolutely. But it is not a, a, a hearing where you come in and provide testimony. In this particular case, you had three opportunities in the House and three opportunities in the Senate to educate the people on those committees about the importance of seeing things your way. Um, when you, uh, conference is open, you can go, if you can figure out the conference schedule, it's a real mess. Conference is a real mess. You've got all these hundreds of bills, all the things happening at the same time. A conference committee might meet for 15 minutes about this matter and then adjourn until the next day. So it's really hard to call a conference. But if you have been intimately involved, if you are like, this is a non-point source pollution measure, and you are like the person in the state that knows a uh, non-point source pollution issue better than anybody else, then you need to be in close contact with the chairs of the conference committee so that you know when these are going to take place. This isn't a normal thing, and most people do not do this, but if you are a very authoritative person, authoritative person on this topic, then you want to be at conference, because you can't testify, but you can be sitting there in the audience, and they can turn their lovely eyes upon you and say, we're stuck here, we need a little bit more, uh, a little more information. And so you can add to your influence that way. Uh, if it's not something you're deeply involved in, Find something else to do. <laughs> yeah. So, conference creates the conference draft one version. Bicycles are mandatory if you're 18. Pay a dollar, wear a helmet. Um, let's go back in time a little bit. Public Land Development Court, TLDC, <laughs> that's, that's guaranteed to get people's blood pressure moving. <laughs> One of the reasons that got repealed last year is that 
in violation of all that is sacred, at least 11 new things were added to that measure at conference. How that happened, why that happened, is completely beyond me. I cannot answer that. I don't know. But these were 11 things the public never had a chance to say yes or no to. And so people were pissed. <laughs> and the bill got repealed. So how are the people? Where the people lead, the leaders ultimately must follow. So on we go. Conference draft one. Now, neither the House Committee of the Whole nor the Senate Committee of the Whole, all of the members of the legislature, legislature, they haven't had a chance to debate this yet. And so the, this new version of the bill goes to both the floors, and then that's where they have the rankers' partisan debate. You, see, you really see people uh, during, during the floor debates get, get quite hot under the collar. Um, but this is, this is where those, uh, those big debates happen. And so both chambers have a chance to have that debate on this matter. It passes and it goes to the governor who can sign veto or about to become law without his signature. If he vetoes it, <laughs> the legislature can come back into session and vote to override. It has to be two-thirds of both the House and the Senate members in order to override a veto. First governor to ever have a bill veto in the state, in the guess? In override? Uh, it was um, Titano, Democratic governor, Democratic House, Democratic Senate. They still didn't like what he was up to. It was just like, no, no, no. And so they did that. Um, and so, of course, after that, there have been numbers of them. But he must have been um, dismayed. <laughs> we'll say. Now, if the, the, the calendar has some very tight restraints, bills that get uh, passed on the last day of the session, there is. Um, a 45-day period after that in order for the governor to consider the things that came to him at the end of the session. 35 days before or after the end of session, <coughs> he has to send the legislature a list of bills that are under consideration for veto. It's not to say that he will veto them. It's to say Here's the list of ones that I'm scratching my chin about. Um, and that is so the legislature, the House and the Senate, the Speaker and the President can look over this list going, is there anything on this list, if he vetoes it, that we want to come back in a special session for, to try to override that. And so um, it's uh, required that he gives fair warning. And so if he doesn't, then uh, he's, he's out of luck. So, change it. Started out with this little fish and it's taken flight now. And that's because of your input as citizens that you were the ones, your authority caused this um, this bill to pass. So Betty's 18. She got her help, she got her money, she's on the road. All our traffic loves are soft. So we celebrate. Yay. Good question. Yes. What are writers? Writer's not a term that we really use here, but uh, bills are amended. Mm -hmm. And so just as the process of amending through the hearings process, that's, that's basically mm -hmm. what that yeah. yes. At what point, in, in your knowledge, would you say that professional mm -hmm. lobbyists are most likely to succeed in interjecting their whatever? Professional lobbyists. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody on the Conference earth is a lobbyist. So. What about the point where there's no public input like the conference? Well, you had a lot of influence on this bill. You had six different opportunities in public hearings process. Nobody uh, except legislators make decisions at conference. And so, you know, there's always going to be paid advocates. I have one time had a woman say, oh, I don't know how to lobby. I just said, it's like, yeah, you do. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. It's that everybody on earth is a lobbyist. No, no, no. I would not wear that title. It's like, well, you ever heard a hungry baby cry? That's very effective lobbying. A teenager wants a car keys. 
That's lobbying. That's mm -hmm. me. So, yeah. So if you got to this point, if your bill made it this far along the way, you sure didn't do it all by yourself. You know, there are a lot of people involved. If you have, and we talked about this briefly earlier, get to know the staff people. Call them up. You'll get to be on a first night. I'll get, yeah. You get to, you get to uh, people, you get to know folks on the phone, and if you can, you come over and visit and that sort of thing. So call them up and say thanks. It's, uh, and let Bob here, the five legislative food groups. This is what we live on during session. Salt, sugar, fat, caffeine, and preservatives. <laughs> <laughs> cookies. Send them cookies. So, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, I'm if not, I'll make something up. Uh, yeah. Is the just the ones that would send in, or is that the staff group? Say that again? Do these guys, these legislators, do they read these testimonies that we send them, or they let Almost them certainly. They yes. Do yes. Uh, when I chaired, uh, when I clerked for the House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee, which is back in the 90s, um, and this is before we came online, I'll grant you that, but we would come, my boss and uh, an assistant and I would meet at 5.30 in the morning, and we'd go through the entirety of the stack of testimony before the committee that day, and so what stands out for you, and how about for you? So you have to have your testimony in 24 hours in advance, and that's so they can read it. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, if it's foreign testimony, if you got a big stack of things that all say identical, nobody's going to be flipping through there going, I wonder if anybody appended anything in here. They're not going to do that. They don't have time. Yes. I'm just curious, has it ever happened that a governor vetoes the bill and the special session is not called in to override it? Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. He vetoes, he vetoed, uh, three bills last year. They didn't come back in. They, they left them. What's the criteria for that? That would have to, it would depend on what he has to say. Anytime he issues a veto, he has to send a letter along with the veto saying, this is my reasoning. And so that's all available online, and I can show you where. Let's see, yeah. Yeah, um... Y'all ask good, you ask a lot of questions too, yeah. Uh, I came to your meeting last year and loaded down for information. In uh, Mountain View? Yeah. yeah. There was four of us at that meeting. <laughs> things changed. Yeah. Uh, things have changed this year. Uh, you were very, it was very helpful um, with the Hawaii Sustainable Community Alliance. And we had a bill. Um, that was introduced in the House and in the Senate, you know, the companion bills. And the bill in the House passed through all the committees. It did the crossover. It got deferred by Malama Solomon's committee in the Senate. Okay, so I've, I've heard different versions about like what happens now. Where does it start well, this year? Well, it, 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 it was in her committee that it stopped. Mm -hmm. That's Waterland, right? Senate Waterland? Yeah. That's where it is right now, and that's where it can come back to life. Okay. Now, if we, in the interim, we've made some um, amendments to the original, to, to that bill, um, and we have Senator Ruderman um, introducing that bill as a, as a Senate bill because it's an amended bill. And so, um, we made amendments because of the input we got from you know, along the along the journey to make it more acceptable and more likely to pass. So, how does that work? Does well, the amended version? You didn't make amendments to the, the senator did. Okay, so it, the bill got amended in committee. Uh, along the way, it did, but no, since the session finished last year, we've got a new draft. Okay, so that's not the same bill then. So that starts again. So, is it going to be introduced as a new piece of legislation? Yeah. I think he's asking you what to do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, so, how, how does it work if, if you have... So, no amendments are um, allowed um, um, to be introduced except at once it goes into the committee. Right. So only right. the legislators can amend legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But if you uh, have a different version of the bill, that right. can get easily get introduced under a new bill number. And, and that just starts again. Right. Yeah. It would start from the beginning. Yeah, just... Um, so can we have two...
can s two bills going through. One that sure. got most of the way through last year, and a sure. new one introduced this year. Sure. That adds, adds to the opportunity for it to pass. Yeah. Okay, okay, I see about 300 hands up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get first. <laughs> okay. So if, let's say we have a bill in a committee and we want to write all committee members, we don't want to CC or BC or whatever it is, we want to write each individual one because we heard the fact that if they're getting CCs, they just kind of blow them off in, in an email situation. Well, um, a little later in this presentation, I talk about how to how to communicate effectively with okay. them, and so so we can cover that. But um, email is heavily overused. There are other way, you know, uh, you know that old-fashioned thing, stamp envelope letter thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really effective. So uh, maybe a couple more questions before we move on. Oh. Do, do the bill numbers start over every two years, or how yes. long? So it's not. So yeah. if you want to look up a bill three years ago, it's not going to be there anymore. Oh, it's going to be there, but, you know... Uh, Wouldn't the numbers repeat when you have... Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, not, not, you know, uh, once one human being was named Anne, didn't mean anybody else could never be called Anne. So then how are you going to look it up? I'll be show sure. you. If, if you hang with me a few minutes, I'll show you. So yes. What is the average number of testimony that needs to be received in a, with, on a bill? that will actually change its course. I don't think there's any way of saying that because it would really depend on the, uh, it would depend. You know, you might have an important piece of legislation that the public's not very interested in, concerned about. Might have a handful of people in various committees, but, you know, uh, let's talk. Let's go back to same sex marriage <laughs> legislation. There were 25,000 pieces of testimony submitted, wow. roughly. And you can read them all if you really do need to get out more. So, um, okay. So, maybe this is what happened to our bill. Maybe it has. We're all so happy our bill passed. The life is, life is uh, back in balance again. Most likely this is what's going to happen. Oh, somebody, yeah, Joe is so unhappy. What, what can you do? What if your bill died? What do you do? Is there another bill called Relating to Transportation that's still alive? They testify on that. Send in your testimony. You got this bill about mopeds. That's fine, but boy, you want to make this a good bill? Include this bicycle bill material. So that doesn't work. What else can you do? Next session, have another bill introduced. Keep at it. You just keep at it until you get what you need out of the legislature. Uh, years ago, back in the 80s, 90s, 90s, I get it. back in the 90s, I. Uh, the Hawaii Midwives Alliance um, met for an entire weekend here on this island, and I came over for the meeting, and I spent the entire weekend helping them develop an approach to the legislature. And they said, well, how long is it going to take us? What they wanted to, they were not a legal entity. They wanted to be a legal entity. And they're going, well, how long is it going to take us to do this? And so, well, I said, watch. I mean, how can you answer that? And I said, my guess is five years, you know, because you're going to have to educate these people. You're going to have to get it through committee. Five years it was. It's just like I don't often score that correct like that. Yeah. So bills die all the time. Ideas never die. So you just hold that precious idea until it blossoms into legislation that will solve all our traffic wars. So, so is this something you actually do? You come to the community and, and, and help people? Uh, or, I mean, That's what I'm doing tonight. Introduce their bills, like yeah. help them yeah. <laughs> Oh, I just, I uh, taught them how the process worked. There were a whole bunch of us. They pulled oh, together this. It was the same. Kind of yeah, it was kind of the same, but this one, Andy Levin was in the Senate and he came and, and uh, talked to them for a while. And it's just like, it was like this broad, expansive thing about how can we understand governance. That's quite a quite an undertaking to do that. So, yeah. I get the whole time the bottom line is always funny. Um, where, where do we get the money from? And whether or not, you know, we were talking about bicycles. Um, you know, more people would buy bicycles because they felt safe with bicycle lanes <laughs> yeah. on the streets and on the boat. Um, it's true. They felt safe, safe to do so. Now, there's probably money in the federal government that will go to the state to give to the county. 
you know, the, the trickle down effect of how we're going to call it. But you have to do the homework, find out the bill and the money that and the federal government gives the state to make the highways wide and the bicycles. That's, that's the primary focus of the um, of Congress is uh, as a funding mechanism for the states. Yeah, that and just being obstructive. But you have you have to tell them where where they. Oh, there's money in the, in this program. You want to you have a close a close relationship uh, to the extent that you're comfortable doing it with your federal legislators. You know, we um, we have a lot of access in Hawaii. You know, we have a small um, federal delegation because we're a small state, but we have unusual access to our people. I am. I'm and in the state legislature, we have unusual access as well. The woman that used to run my office a long time ago left for, I don't understand why anybody would leave Hawaii and go to Phoenix, Arizona, but she did. <laughs> she did. She decided that she wanted to go and uh, meet with her legislators. So she went down to the state house. If you've ever been there, it's a really ugly building. It's not like that at all. But anyway, they like it. So she went and she went to the door of the Capitol and she's trying to get in, the door's not opening, and here came the security guard. Like, what are you trying to do? Oh, I'm trying to go see, see my senator, my representative. Do you have an appointment? No. Then you can't come in. It's like, that would be unheard of in Hawaii. And so, uh, so she had to go home and call and you know do the supplication, make the appointment before she got, had to come in. So, so, um, Sometimes it's really helpful to me to go and visit other states and to see how they do it. And it's just like, we do some things kind of weird here, but we have more access than, than most people do to their, to their um, lawmaking authority. So, don't give up. Next year's coming around. And then back to that biennium. You know, there are going to be some good bills sitting there waiting for the session to start. And then there will be probably 1,500 additional ones or so. Use that interim well, and then the whole process starts all over again. So let's talk about the mechanics of this thing. Capital.hawaii.gov, the legislature's website. If you're on the website and you get lost, can't figure out where you are, what had just happened. So you can either click on this up here, that'll take you home, or you can click on the home button in the upper right corner. Everything that will be scheduled for a hearing will be in this section of the website. Now, early on in the set, and these are all listed as individual measures. These are not by hearing notice. This is individual bills and resolutions are listed. So early in the session, when there are like millions of things going on, they have this, uh, if you can see that view full screen. So that's what I wind up having to do. Um, because, pity me, I have to read every hearing notice that comes through. So. Um, this is where you will find, if you cannot find something that you want to testify on something, and it's not in this list, it's not scheduled for a hearing. So bear that in mind. Here's that see it. If It's like, I was going to talk about this House Bill 2040 when I was going to write testimony, but gosh, oh, look down here, electronic waste. This looks interesting, too. So um, this see it will take you to any hearing notice. How are you going to find out what it is you want to testify on? Get to it. You need a bill number, House Bill 123. When you're doing this, every bill and every resolution has its own page, its own status page. It's called status or history, everything that's taken place. So you want to find it. So you would put in here House Bill 123. Do not include House Draft 1, anything like that. Basic bill number that it was born with. Maybe you don't know the number. So keyword search. Bicycle, stick that in. Or do this, B-I-C-Y-C-L asterisk. That's going to pull up bicycle, bicycles, bicycling. Anything that has that is the root letter. So, excuse me, the keyword search, it searches the whole bill, not just the title. Right. The whole Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. So, and um, then you can also search by dates. It's like, gosh, what did I miss on... January 27th last year. Uh, you can go back and find out. Hearing notification. Uh, the legislature has made it incredibly easier than it ever was to, to be actively involved 
you would like to get hearing notices for things that matter to you specifically. So how would you go about that? In the upper right corner, you can register one time with the legislature. Uh, use your email address and a password, and this will entitle you not just to get notices on things that you want sent directly to you, emails, but also to develop your own bill tracking mechanism, which is a wonderful resource. So this does not expire from year to year. If you've signed in once, or if you've registered once, you will continue to be registered. So next time you come along, just click Sign In. When you do that, these three buttons will change colors. That's how you know you're in with the in crowd. So this has happened. So you can come in, click on this hearing notice, the hearing notification button, and then however many bills or resolutions you want to track, you can put them in here individually. House Bill 123, add. Senate Bill 5, add. House Bill 1702, add the entire list of everything that you're interested in. And every time something is scheduled for one of those measures, you will get an email that says uh, a, hearing, no, a hearing has been set for such and so date and time. This is your warning that it's time to write your testimony. Now, generally, there's 48 hours notice for a hearing. Yes, turn around. And you have to have your testimony in 24 hours in advance. So. Um, it's not like you're not running your own life and feeding your kids and going to work and stuff. But the very fast turnaround time because of that type of time. So, likewise, maybe you're just incredibly interested in um, higher education or Hawaiian affairs. Go and sign up for the hearing notices for committees so that um, housing, you're really interested in public housing, you don't want anything to get past you. So you go in and you uh, sign up to get all of the housing um, hearing notices. You can do that too. Uh, usually at the beginning of the session, we'll get the young and eager and they'll come through and go, well, by God, I want to know what's really going on down there. So I signed up for all those hearing notices. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you three days, three days. Um, and so, and then you can always come back in and subtract out the ones that, <laughs> what have I done? Really, I should have paid attention to what Mother said. So, this is the thing that I find enormously important and helpful. Measure tracking. You can create as many lists as you want. You can title them however you want. If you're part of a HUI, a sustainable living community, maybe you're going to have a lot of things you're going to testify on. You're not going to want to do it all by yourself because you really don't want to just sizzle and, and go off into the stratosphere. So maybe you're going to have a hui and you're going to say, you've got 10 people who have agreed to write testimony on these things. So maybe you have a list. Here's Bam Bam's list and here's Pebbles and here's, here's Barney's and here's uh, Betty's. And so you can make your list that way. Or you can have a list that's for housing and another for military affairs and however you decide to make your list. And then you populate them with the bills and resolutions that uh, matter to you. This is an example from a couple of years ago, that some of the things we were tracking in my office. Um, um, and so um, there was a task force thing going on. So we had created this list, and you can, you can edit the name, you can delete the list. If you, you've already established it, so you show the list, and this is what it might look like. You'll see that there is a notes section here. And this is where you can um, sort things because right up here, you can export this list into Excel, add your notes, sort it, divide it however you choose to do it, and then send that Excel sheet to everybody that's going to be involved. And they have their assignments because you will have put them into your notes section. And you can be enormously effective with this. Wonderful thing. This is, a, a, the woman that works with me just added this, and I think this is really good. Bill's die all the time, as you know. And so, 
Or just uh, instead of just deleting it from your list after oh. it's gone by chaos, just maybe move it over to a new list that says dead bills. Now it's very rare for this to happen, but sometimes um, the stone won't rolls away. You know, it's Easter morning. I don't know. <laughs> uh, bills get brought back. Very rare for this to happen, but if the speaker or the president makes a decision that this bill needs to be brought back into committee. First, there might be some um, some really compelling thing. 9-11, we went into special session after 9-11 and some, some extraordinary measures had to take place. So just bear that in mind. Check it once a week. See if anything has changed. Most likely it won't, but you don't want to be missing. This is a bill status page. Every bill, every resolution has its own page. And let me show you what this, this is a wealth of information here. Say you liked this bill, Senate Bill 1, whatever it is, a recognition of Native Hawaiian people. So you've looked at this and you go, I don't want to testify on this. You can do it directly from the status page on your computer. So click on that and you will go into the online testimony um, form. Let me show you what else here. At the top of the page, up here, in the big, fat, fattest letter, biggest letters on the page, is going to be a hyperlink to the most current version of this measure. So this would be the one that you would be testifying on if it was scheduled for a hearing. If you click on this version, you're going to go into the HTML version, which is just like a bunch of text. If you were to click on the little PDF uh, icon here, you would see the pages numbered exactly the way the <coughs> legislators would be looking at it. So if you were watching on Naleo, it's on here, and you hear legislators say, I really have a concern about this, uh, this uh, section four on page three, then you can go directly to that, line 26. And say, I don't know what line 26 says, but this is how you would find out. So in this case, this bill was given this title, would not change. However, the description will change. And this description is right here reflective of this version of the measure. Think of this as a little Cliff Notes version of Cliff Notes uh, view of what this matter would be. Somebody asked me about this the other night. What in the world, January 7, 2059, why, what are they doing? I want you to know this is what passes for entertainment in my life. <laughs> this is called a defective effective date. It really is. Why would you do that? This is a placeholder. So this matter is working its way through committees. They haven't gotten a lot of stuff worked out yet, and so that plug in some date. It's going to, it needs an effective date. All bills need an effective date. Stick something in there. July 1st, 2099. You see that quite often. You know? And I will just mention that these bills go through dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of sets of eyes all along the way. And yet, humans being humans, when Governor Lingle was in office, somehow a bill made it out of the legislature and into her hands with a defective effective date in there. And so there were all kinds of, I was just like, oh, I don't even remember now what it was, but it's just like, <laughs> I died and went to hell. What? <laughs> you know, what happened? Here's another thing that is so interesting in my life. Senators Solomon and Dela Cruz names are in all caps. Senator Kochi's name is not. Well, why? Well, Senator Solomon in this case would have been considered first primary introducer. Her name shows up first. Senator Del Cruz was also a primary introducer. So when Senator Solomon, whose, whose baby this was, she would have had a staff member uh, taking this bill around to various senators in advance of its introduction, saying, would you like to sign on to this measure? Um, and sometimes these are limited by, you know, fewer people will sign on as sponsors for bills simply because Everybody's running around with these things all at the same time, so you just might not find whoever it is in time. But when it came to Senator Kochi, he didn't underline his name. 
So that's why his name is in Jamal. <laughs> so he's considered actually a, uh, um, a, a um, so first primary introducer, primary introducer, co-sponsor. So yeah. Have we clicked on the bill number? This is that HTML. It's just uh, written out this way. And this is what the PDF version looks like. Line four, page one, so forth and so on. <coughs> Down here is the history of everything that will have happened to this measure. Now, early in the session, when hundreds of these bills are getting introduced, it's, uh, there's a little bit of delay because it's just human beings sticking this stuff into the system. And so they, they get stuff up as fast as they can. But after that initial um, burst, um, usually in less than a day, this stuff will be updated. But early on, it sometimes it takes several days just because there's so much going on. So if it's early in the session and you're sure that something is happening, you're not seeing it, just call the office and, and ask whoever it is and say, I know that you were going to introduce a bill, what's the story? And then, you know, just um, use the phone. I got that for you remember. This is what this is going to look like in here. Everybody, you'll see who voted how in committee. Usually there are fewer of the no votes uh, because people want to sit on the conference committee and all. But it's easier to list, uh, for floor votes especially, it's easier to list the people who did not vote yes. And so instead of having maybe on the House side, you might have 48 yeses, one excused, and two voted no. And so you just going to list the two no's and the, the one excused. So. Over here, you're going to find every version of this measure. So say this is up for a hearing, you want to testify on it, and when this thing moved to the Senate Draft 2, when this one was created, something that you liked in the Senate Draft 1 got left out. Maybe you would like to write your testimony to say, please reinsert the language from Senate Draft 1 or whatever, so you have easy access to this information. And each time you go into these, you will also find that little three or four or five line description. So you'll have kind of the, the, little, um, the little microcosm of what it's about. You will see committee reports interspersed here. Every time a bill moves from one committee to the next, it is accompanied by a report so that the next committee will have a good idea of what just uh, why did you make these decisions in your committee? So a committee report is going to say the purpose of this measure is to blah, blah, blah. These are some of the people that testify, like the attorney general, members of the public, that sort of thing. And then following that is this is what we did with the bill, here's why. Those can be very helpful. Below that, you'll see right down here, down in this area, all of the testimony that would have been submitted about this matter is archived and it's all right here. So this, um, if you, for instance, uh, were involved in some sort of a domestic abuse situation and you didn't want your home phone number listed for the entire public to see, don't put it in here because nobody comes along and goes, I wonder if this should be in there. It is scanned and posted. Um, up here, so say you're watching a hearing on, on Naleo and it's a Senate hearing and they did something in the committee and you go, what? What is that? What did they just do? I don't understand. So you can click on Senate, right here. That would take you to the Senate's page and then down here you could go in and read the rules. And so you can, you can find out all sorts of stuff just by putting, these are the sorts of things, you had your glasses while you're sitting around, you're not quite ready to go to sleep, and just put them around on these pages and see what it is you see. Under links, right here, you'll find all sorts of things, including a link to the public access rooms page. On these whole list of links, it used to be just real direct access, you click on this and you wind up on the public access page. and then. When you looked in there a couple years ago, and it's like, 
Look at all these disclaimers in him now. The lawyers got hold of this, didn't they? And he's like, yep, that's what happened. <laughs> and so they have these things now. And so you just bypass them and keep going. So, uh, Public Access Room's website. Here's the, the address. We will send out newsletters usually once a month during the legislative session. Not very much more than that. Um, and But we try to focus our newsletters on what is going on currently. Um, if it's toward the end of session, there might be an article on conference committee, that sort of thing. Um, how do you add your voice to the mix? Question? Yes. Is there a tutorial for what you just went over and uh, perhaps a frequently asked questions part of it? A tutorial for? What you just went over. Um, on, the, on the interface that you just presented. You mean? A tutorial for us. You can go to the website. Uh, this entire presentation is online, in both the video and PowerPoint. Oh, okay. So, how do you add your book? <coughs> um, we talked about this. Email is heavily overused. In some, if you're emailing directly to a legislator, a lot of them get huge numbers of emails, and so you might get an auto-response that says, if you are not my constituent, I may not respond directly to you. Um, so bear that in mind. Email has its place, but it's overused, so send a letter. Pick up the phone. The phone is wonderful. You know, just give a call. Tell them what you think. Okay, make your input effective. If you're going to, and this applies whether you're writing testimony, if you're just sending uh, your legislators uh, uh, what you think about something, you might be writing to all the members of a committee to say when it comes time for you to look at such and so, here's what I think about it. One page. You don't, these are really busy people. And so the shorter your input, the more carefully it's going to be read. It's just that simple. Use your own words and be courteous. I tell this story at every workshop, and I'm going to tell it again. When I when I clerked for uh, House Energy and Environment, I was taking notes one day. It's a public hearing. There are all of these measures being heard. This guy got up to testify. We're, we're poised, ready to take notes of what he has to say. And he started out by pounding his fist on the table. He's like, this is not going to go well. So he put the pen down and just wait because you just knew something was going to come up. And he started, the words directly out of his mouth were, I know you're all a bunch of damn crooks. Let me tell you what you're going to do. Well, it's Bill Dyer. Don't tell him that. <laughs> just don't. So up front, I support this bill. I support this. I, I hope you will not so and so. Up front. Tell them up front because they're not going to have a lot of time. And so you want to be as thick of it as poetry rather than prose when you do this. So do include your, your name, especially if you're sending an email. Email testimony, by the way, started in our tiny little office. And as far as we know, we're still the only state in the nation that has email testimony for people. And so when we were, and yeah, there's a good story about that too. We don't have time for but um, if you are sending an email to somebody, do include your name. We, um, we pass it on to the House and Senate to handle when we got past 12,000 pieces of testimony in one session. Um, but this email came in, and it's testimony on something, and it's like sunshinesuperman at gmail.com. And you think, well, so maybe maybe this person's going to be at the hearing. And can't you just imagine the committee members going, so Superman. <laughs> so, you know, tell them you're John or Joe or somebody. <laughs> you only offer testimony when a matter is scheduled for a hearing and there is a hearing notice posted with instructions for how to submit the testimony. Short turnaround time, usually 48 hours. Usually you have to have yours in 24 hours in advance. This is what a hearing notice might look like. So it's going to say the chamber, House or Senate. Names of the committee, in this case it was two committees, uh, Ed and Higher Ed. Um, and then the date, time, and place of the hearing. This is information you're going to need in your testimony. And after that, it will be a listing of all of the measures that are scheduled to be heard. 
following that at the end, it's probably going to say decision making to follow, but it, if it's particularly if it's a morning hearing, it might say decision making to follow if time allows. And that is because the House meets at noon, the Senate meets at 11.30 in the morning, so on, on days when there are floor sessions. And so if you have a hearing going on in the morning, say it starts at 8.30 or something, uh, maybe there's a lot of people to testify on, on these matters. You might have 10 or 12 things on that agenda. And so the, the process is going to be, the chair is going to say, please come up and testify, Bill, the first bill on the agenda, the second. And so they're going to go through the testimony in sequence, most likely. On, um, they're going to hear all the testimony, the first thing on the agenda, and then the second, then the third. And then they're going to come back and start their decision making. And if time runs out, they may not be able to do that decision making on that same day. So they may have to, within a couple of days, post a new hearing notice that says decision making hearing. And so if that's the case, there would be another notice posted and it would say decision making only, no public testimony will be accepted because it's basically the second half of that initial hearing. Mm -hmm. Below that, you're going to find the instructions for submitting the testimony. Now, this varies from committee to committee. I think email testimony is going to go away at some point, because what they're doing is encouraging people to come in and submit testimony via the website. On that Submit Testimony button, on the status page because it's easier on the other side for people that are processing it. Now, if you need a sign language interpreter or you have some special needs, down in here you will find, in this case it says house interpreter at capital.hawaii.gov and so you let them know that you're going to need some special accommodation you have to do that quickly. This is that handout that came to you on the back of one of these. Here's, uh, this you're going to have to have this. The name of the committee, the date, time, and the place of the hearing, and the bill number. And I can tell you, when testimony comes in, like used to in our office, it's like, I wonder what they're testifying about. <laughs> oh, I don't know a bill number. You know, they need the bill number. And this is more free form. Introduce yourself. Tell, tell up front what you think about this bill. There was a guy at the Capitol for many years, um, David. He'd come sit down in his chair at the public hearing. I'm David so-and-so, such-and-so organization with 5,000 voting members in the state of Hawaii. So everybody knew that 5,000 people were backing up David's opinion. And so let them know that you're part of a large hui. Um, if that's the case. So I, I support House Bill 123. And then explain a little bit about that, why you support House Bill 123. Likewise, you can say, I really like sections 1 and 4. I think you need to drop section 2, and I suggest you amend section 3 as well. So, or I oppose this bill altogether. If you are there to oppose, or if you're sending in written testimony in opposition to something, do suggest alternatives. You're actually not just doing this in order to bitch. You're trying to get something real out of this. So, they want to hear your ideas. So, uh, restate your position and then get in, get out, name and contact information. Tell them three times. I support House Bill 123. I support this important piece of legislation because blah, 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 blah. In closing, I really uh, hope you will join me in supporting this important piece of legislation. Three is a magic number. Hearing notice will tell you how the testimony uh, can be submitted. Choose one. And a couple years ago, I had a guy call me and he said, boy, I wanted to make sure they got it. So I sent them testimony every way I could think of. He said, you really don't want to piss them off. You know, they're busy. And it's like, we saw a Joe White's testimony, and now we see it again. And here it is a third time, and a fourth. And we're just starting to get this way about Joe's testimony. So, one way. If you can also submit directly from the Submit Testimony button, you would enter your bill number, House Bill 123. Do not include the additional stuff. If this matter is not scheduled for a hearing, you will not be able to 
fill out the form. If it is scheduled for a hearing and you put in House Bill 123, then the contact information at the top is going to be uh, populated for you, date, time, and places, and all of that. Now, if you have uh, an organization that has letterhead, use the letterhead. Write your testimony on that letterhead, save it as a Word document, and then go along, upload it, because you want them to start recognizing your testimony. Mm -hmm. If that's not the case, you can just go in here to additional comments and write whatever it is you'd like them to know about. This is something I would like to see them change. It's not always this clear cut, I support, I oppose. So sometimes people will write comments if they have some support. I support parts and I oppose other parts. Thank you if you're going to come over and visit us and come to the hearing and testify. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important matter. Keep it short and sweet. Uh, 5,000 voting members in the state of Hawaii. I support, I oppose. Do not tell them they're all a bunch of damn crooks. <laughs> Remember to read. You know, people that haven't gone to the Capitol and testified, it can be an intimidating process. These are just the most regular folks. Think of them as your neighbors. You know. And then uh, one time, I, when I first moved to Hawaii, I was green, I was wet behind the ears, I was fresh off the boat. I took a class in, at uh, Hawaii Community College on Hawaiian religions. And I just wanted to learn more about my chosen home. And it was back in 1984. <coughs> And so I'm going along and I'm learning about Buddhism and Mormonism and this and that and the ancient religions. And then the instructor says, and each of you has to get up and tell a Hawaiian legend. And it's like, I am dead meat. I am just this little howling girl. You know, I'm going to come in here at a class of Hawaiian people and teach them about their legends. I'm just going to go fling myself into the river now. You know? So I was, I was um, fretting over this. And my friend said, so what are you going to tell them? What story are you going to tell them? And I said, I'm going to use Pohaku Okane. I've been collecting stones since I was like eight years old, so I have all these stones. And he said, well, you love stone, right? And I said, yeah. Of course I do. Everybody knows I like stones. And he said, tell them, tell them a story about your friend the stone. I was like, ah. So tell them a story about your friend the bill. And just make it, uh, you know, these people get uh, kind of hammered at a lot. You want testimony, when you know you've got them, it's when you're in the hearing room and you see them leaning forward a little bit, you hear more of your story, that's when you got them. So, uh, really, most of them are really nice people. At least they would treat them like that. It would be very effective for you. Do not exaggerate your material. Tiny place, intimate setting, the state of Hawaii, small and personal. Everybody knows everything about everyone. The minute you exaggerate your material, your history is a resource. Listen to those that you disagree with very carefully. Plant those seeds in common soil. Fast turnaround time. Form testimony only does half of what testimony can do. It will give numbers of people who support or oppose something. If you write out two or three sentences in your own words, that will be read. If you send in form testing, you know, people will set up websites, it's like, just go in here and click this button and this testimony will be submitted in your, on your behalf and we've left a little space down here because they really will appreciate hearing your own words. Nobody's going to read that. I'll just tell you that right now. Super fairy, you know, I living on Kauai, so super fair. I was I was on vacation the day they scheduled this hearing and 4,000 pieces of testimony came into my office and I had one guy working in there and they told him all these people. But there's stacks like this, literally like this, of foreign testimony. And you thought anybody's going to go through here going, I wonder if anybody has anything personal to say in here. It's just not going to happen. But this stack over here, that got read. Keep it short. Um, if you have missed the deadline in a reasonable amount of time, uh, 24 hours, maybe you got it in 25 hours, maybe you got it in the next day, but that becomes part of the permanent record. 
you've probably got something incredibly compelling to say. Maybe this bill is going to die, but maybe next year it's not. Somebody's going to come along and go, that was really good testimony. I'm going to steal it, you know. But <laughs> they're, they're, that big, that's a really important thing. Your words are really important, so turn it in anyway. This is my favorite slide. There's no <laughs> cure for the political virus. <laughs> You get it? Yeah, I used to think I was the least political person I knew. Well, so, it's what do you do with this virus? There is no known cure for this virus. Will you participate actively in your own governance for the rest of your life and for the sake of us all? This is the, entry, the opening door to my office. You're always welcome because it's your office. So come in and view. Here's my favorite cartoon in the whole wide world. Anybody ever seen this before? Yeah. This is the truth of governance. <coughs> hey, just take a moment and look at it. Oh, oh we just wanted a little free swing. <laughs> Somebody last night, night before last said, oh my God, look at what the state agency did. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but then you look at this, it's like you put your child on this and your yeah. kid's got a concussion, you know? Yeah. My favorites are right here. <laughs> Have you ever been in a newspaper yeah. article? They got something wrong, didn't they? They didn't do it because they're evil people. They did it because they're just as overworked and underpaid and all of that as the rest of us. And so I have, I have a little compassion for the people that write it wrong. Of course, that goes with this, as understood by the public. But you know, I also put this in here, a couple of reasons. We're in a deadly serious line of work. You know, sometimes this is life and death when they were going to no longer do uh, diabetes treatment for the Pacific Islanders. And a fellow came into my office with tears coming down his face saying, why did they want me to die? You know, just, oh. And so it's, it's serious stuff we're doing. So if you interject a little humor into your work, you're, you're, they're not going to, you know, if you come in and you're reading a dirge to them, they're going to want to run from you. So line it up a little bit. You know, a little, you can get people to laugh, you can get people to listen. And then the other thing I put this in here for is just a reminder that there are at least not different perspectives on the same thing all the time. Truth is absolute and our perceptive perceptions of it are very different. So. I can go into more. Do you, is that a hand up or are you yes. just waiting at me? Well, I had a question about that uh, the agency. They can help actually implement a bill? They have to. So here's the deal. That's a really good a question. Bureaucrat. So the legislature passes laws and those are implemented in the executive branch. So uh, let's go. I made reference earlier to the medical marijuana. When that passed into law, that was put in the executive branches of public safety and health committees. And so, all right, uh, yeah, the Department of Health and the Department of Public Safety. And so it's in the departments where the laws are kind of carried out. And so besides the, the say this matter is going to pass into law, there's more to it than that because who, whichever executive agency is charged with carrying this out also has to write rules about it. And so, this is just the beginning. I got one in particular, I don't know if you know much about it, but this thing about having a birth certificate to get a driver's license of life, is that implemented by the agency? Uh, well, the agency would be the Department of Health. That's where the birth certificate would come from. Okay. Yeah. So the three here's the deal. You got three branches of government. If you place the weight on a three-legged stool, you can put a lot of weight on that stool if those three legs are in balance with one another. And so that's that's how that one works. So it's not just the legislature. It has to be implemented by the executive branch. And then uh, Super Ferry, the brawl between the ex 
executive and the legislature was solved at the judiciary level when the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot do this. So, three branches. Three's a magic number. Um, I will go through this very quickly because people are probably tired. Reports and lists. You can find out all kinds of stuff here, and we could spend a week and a half just on the reports and lists section, but this is where you can do your deadline tracking. You can see uh, all kinds of uh, everything that a particular legislator uh, introduced. This is what it looks like. Um, and I'm going to hasty through this because I can go live to the website and show you something a little more readily with this. So, and back to the legislature's website under archives. You can go back as far as 1999 to see everything that has been introduced. You can now sort, you can search through all of those years at once. So if you're going to do that, narrow your search. Right? You put in education, the computer's just going to fry because that's a lot, you know. And it will only search up to 300 entries. So, so early childhood education. If you know a specific year when something happened, then go to that year. And somebody asked about this earlier. How can I find out about earlier years? Oh, she yeah. Yes, that lady. So here it is. This is what she's missing. So um, who sat on the committees in that year? Well, how many governor's messages were filed? All of this stuff. So it's been some time. Does it tell you how much testimony was given on bills? Um, in the more recent years, it does. In the earlier ones, it does not. Is that, you, is that testimony available? Or? That's what I'm saying. It is, uh, in this case, see right here, 2010. Here's a link to testimony. Um, earlier years, testimony was not archived on the website, but it is held. If it's not in the hands of a committee still, because like, different people. I just people. wanted the recent stuff like last year. I wanted to go read. Oh, yeah. You can read all of last year's testimony. Yeah. Um, uh, early, early time uh, state archives. Yeah. What does the law itself say? Let's go here just briefly. Hawaii Revised Statutes. This is the laws as they exist. So. There are various ways that you can research um, the HRS. Um, and here's that bicycle, use the asterisk. You can search for everything that says those as the root letters. Uh, there's an index, there's a table of contents. But maybe somebody says to you, you need to go read chapter 291C, section 146, because you'll just be amazed. And you go, well, how am I going to do that? You, you will browse. And if you browse, you're going to find a directory-driven search. So, we have 14 volumes of laws in the state of Hawaii. 291C is going to be right here in volume 5. These are hyperlinks. Anytime you click on this, you're going to go into the next deeper directory. So, 291C is what we want. We click on volume 5. And we've truncated this for the purpose of this slide. There's a whole bunch of others. You would scroll down until you got to the hyperlink for 291C. Now, what I tell people to do then, you click on 291C, rather than going directly to section 146, open the very first link. It's going to end with .htm. And this is going to be the table of contents for that whole chapter. I think this is an important thing to do because if you just went and read that one section, you're lacking the context. It's like, I read this one, I don't know what, what's it all about. And so read the first one. If you do that in this case, you will see that 291C is the traffic code. Do you know how many laws there are in Hawaii? A billion. Yeah. That's a billion? A billion. A billion. Yeah, I think so. There's 14 volumes of I have no idea how many. Oh, how much? Well, some it doesn't it doesn't necessarily just accumulate, and that's a superb thing to bring up. Bills can be introduced that would create laws, amend laws, repeal laws, or propose amendments to the Constitution. Yeah. Because I have a theory we should send people to Washington to everywhere to repeal, to get rid of laws. We really need all 
Well, I keep saying, you know, we got 14 volumes of laws. Couldn't we sit out a session, you know, and not go into a session? The Constitution doesn't say that. So, so read first this, um, the first entry, and then go and read section 146. And you're going to have that larger view. So if you go now, you, you know we're talking about the statewide traffic code. And this is not made up. I want you all to know this is legitimate, true law. You just read it. Read first. This is the law. It is against the law to ride a bicycle without at least one hand on the handlebars. This is true. So we, we all started out as common criminals. The minute your mom wasn't looking, this is what you did. Hang on just a second. I want to translate some of this stuff to the bottom first. This was... I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> so, bicycle. 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 You guys are just here for the okay. So in the legislature of 1971, in Act, why, I don't know why C stands for Act. Act 150, part of Section 1, created this law. It was amended in the legislature of 1984 in Act 273, Section 13. So this is legitimate law. This is it. So that's what I got to tell you. I didn't quite hear the whole exchange between you and the young lady here. You can actually, you can actually write testimony to a legislator to be, get rid of the law. Well, a bill would be introduced that would repeal section, or that's that would repeal hard. chapters. Is that harder to do than pass a law? It's no. not saying. It's, it's, so, bills will be introduced to, and this is what you missed, to create law, amend law, repeal law, or propose constitutional amendments. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that is. If anybody wants to take, I'm going to close that. Let's see. Here is the live legislature's website. Reports and lists. This is just a really quick example. If you want to come in here and, for instance, search appropriations, go in uh, the example I came up with. Senate, let's see. You can search special funds. Maybe you want to see if Senator Green, for instance, introduced any legislation that had to do with special funds. So you come in here, do your search, and see here you can find that. He was involved in the introduction of 11 different documents that had to do with special funds. You guys are probably tired, and I don't want to yes. overwhelm you with a bunch of stuff. So poke around on the reports and lists page, and if you have questions, then just give us a call. Here, everything that Senator Hashem introduced, this is how you would find those, these kinds of things. You guys did great. Thank you. How long did it take to actually get this done? Well, this uh, report to list has been recently added last year. But the basic rewrite of the whole website was done in a matter of months. It's amazing because this is a powerful tool. And again, no kidding. You look at the, the other big elephant in the room and the health issue yeah. and, the, and signing people up. Somebody's got the road map already. Yeah, this is this is an amazing, absolutely amazing website. And you know, I've been I've been at the Capitol in one form or another since nineteen ninety four. Every day I learn something new on this site. Thank you. I do have the coolest job, and I cannot. Well, I feel like 